Hello and welcome. Uh, this is Paul Sandu. So again, as I am uh, driving around, doing some work, you know, going to work, I thought it would be a good time to uh, maybe talk a little bit about the subject that I have been uh, putting some videos up on lately. Uh, basically, the subject of Jesus Christ as to who He is. Okay, there is a great deal of confusion in this matter. Okay? People don't really understand that you know who is Jesus Christ. Okay? Is He God? Is He the Son of God? Is he man? Is he the son of man? You know, he's defined or he is uh, described different terms I used to describe him or to define him in the Bible. And because of that, it does get a little bit confusing for people. But God is not the author of confusion. In God's word, the information that he requires us to know and understand is clearly given. What's confusing is that we have Babel minds, okay? When God said, you know, let us go down, and confound their language that really means at the time of the Tower of Babel you can read about that in Genesis chapter 11 what happened is that our information processing faculties were made they were limited okay a limitation was placed on them there was like a virus introduced into our minds so that we could no longer process information on a higher level on God's level this is why in Isaiah we can read I think it's in chapter 55 God says my thoughts are not your thoughts okay my ways are not your ways as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts okay in, in uh, many places in the Bible in numbers in Hosea for example God said God is not man okay he doesn't think like man he doesn't act like man he doesn't process information like man. Okay, so when the information that God has placed in the Word of God is God's information. And because we do not have the same type of information processing capabilities that God does, therefore, we get confused. But as I said, God is not the author of confusion. This confusion does not come from His Word or from what's in the Bible. It is us that are not capable or because there is always some sort of interference, okay? It is like, you know, when you watch uh, TV, for example, especially those of you who are a little bit older, you remember in the old days when they had those rabbit ears and stuff, you know, you had to move around and shake around and picture would get, you know, fuzzy and, and it would uh, not be clear, right? And that is how it is, like, you know, when information is coming into our minds, even like from the Bible and especially from the Bible, the Bible says in, in Jesus, in the parable of the sower, he said, you know, the thief comes immediately to steal the word of God. Okay, so there is like a, a, a shield or a cloak or, or, or some sort of uh, veil is placed over our minds immediately so that we don't comprehend what is actually being said. So what I wanted to talk today is about the word reproduction okay, or to reproduce. Jesus is called the Son of God, okay? and he's also called the Son of Man, so we'll talk about both. But for anybody to be a son, meaning an offspring, okay, it could be, I'm not talking about male or female here, so I'm just talking about an offspring. There has to be, first of all, an original, okay? And then the offspring is a copy that is made from the original. That is what the meaning of the word son is. So in the case of Jesus Christ, if he is the Son of God, it is exactly as it happens in the case of human reproduction that a male and a female, when they cleave to each other, as the Bible says, then, you know, they reproduce. The child is produced, who is an offspring, who is a copy of the parents, okay? may not be an identical copy but nonetheless it is a copy and in the case of Seth for example in the Bible Seth may have been an exact copy of Adam okay just like Jesus Christ is an exact copy of God the Father Seth in the Bible may have been an exact copy of Adam his father because we read in uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 5 in regards to Seth the son of Adam that he was he, he, he begat a son in his 
own image and in his likeness. So he was not just, you know, like apparently Adam. It is said that he was in his exact image, okay? So that's just uh, just as an aside. It doesn't really have anything necessarily to do with what I'm talking about. So when you begin to understand the idea of reproduction in the Bible, it is very central to the teaching of the Bible. It really answers the question as to why did God create anything at all, okay? God is complete in himself, right? He is, he lacks nothing, but he did lack something, which is the reason why he began the process of creation. And as I thought in my last video or two, you know, there is one in Genesis chapter two, after God had formed man and he had made the animals, there is a scripture that says that it was not good for man to be alone, okay? The man Adam was actually quite complete in himself. Okay? He lacked nothing. He was complete, okay? He is the only man that has ever lived that was actually complete in every which way, okay? And he was neither male nor female at that time. You know, people say he was androgynous, he was both. No, not really. He was, uh, anyways, that's something I don't want to just go into it here, but he was a complete person, okay? So he really didn't lack something except the one thing which God said was not good about him was that he was alone. And what applies to Adam is also applicable to us as people. Uh, sorry, is also applicable to God. The God in the beginning was complete and entire in himself and still is. But there was something that he reckoned was not good, which is that he was alone. Okay, God we are told in the Bible is one. So there is only one God. There are not two gods or three gods or four gods. And that is again when I talk about the, the false doctrine of the Trinity, which really teaches you that there are three gods, okay? And they're because they identify them as, them as distinct persons, uh, which is the word hypostasis in the Greek, okay? The person. And that is not correct because in the Bible it is quite clear that there is only one God, the person. That's it, okay? He can reproduce himself in multiple, multiple numbers. I mean, we could be talking in the millions or in the billions as he has with his begotten sons who are born through faith in Jesus Christ. They are also his copies, okay? So therefore, God will be all in all, as we are told in the Bible, in the New Testament time and again. And if he's all in all, then, you know, they're literally like he's, he'll have like innumerable copies. So, but, but that doesn't mean that there are that many persons that are going to be God. The God that is going to be in all the copies is still going to be the one God, okay? That is the reason why, whether it's God, the Father, or the Son of God, or the Holy Spirit, though they are three, there is only one person in all of them, it is the same person of the one God. Okay? That is a little bit of an aside again here. But I wanted to come back to the idea of God being alone and reckoning or calculating that this is something that does not good. And this is the whole reason why he set into motion this amazing creation that he has created. Other than that, the fact that God was alone, that you know, there was no reason for him to create anything whatsoever. All right, so continuing uh, this like, idea. Sorry. To continue this here, this uh, teaching that uh, it was not good for God to be alone. You know, people think you know, that means that God was lonely. Well, not entirely either, okay? Because loneliness is something which is basically an absence of company. But when you're only just the one person, like in the case of Adam, you can't be lonely because there were no other person that you could be in company with. But to be alone means that you have nobody to share what you are, share yourself with. That literally what that means. Because ultimately, the ultimate revelation of God, of who he is, is the ultimate revelation, okay? It is that God is love. And love is something which is only understood and experienced by sharing. Okay, so essentially God could not express his love without having somebody to love. Okay, that is the real meaning of that expression. 
that it was not good for man to be alone. That man had animals, okay, that could be that could keep him company. He could have pets, etc. Like you know, there were plenty of animals that God created, but there was nobody with whom he could share himself on his own level. Okay, like he was the he was alone in that respect that there was not a single creature that existed that was his own kind, that was his own species, with whom when he shared himself, could the other person could share themselves back on an equal level, on a similar, in a similar capacity, okay? That is what is meant by that expression that it was not good for man to be alone. Okay, he literally had no one to love him, okay? He, like with animals, when you have a relationship, it is not necessarily a relationship of love. It can be a relationship of affection. The animal can have affection for the master and the master can have affection for the animal, but it is not like a relationship of love. That is, it is not a relationship that is a relationship between equals. And this was true of man. Like what happened with man? Why God started off by making just the one man and then said it is not good for man to be alone. And from then the man was split into male and female. And then the female and female united in their love and they reproduced and they made more copies of themselves. Okay? This is exactly what God purposed to do with himself. And people think that that reproduction was the man Adam or Adam and Eve. No, that is not the case. Adam and Eve were the vessels through whom him who would be the reproduction of God in its entirety would come forth and that person is Jesus Christ. Okay, Jesus Christ is a perfect and exact reproduction. You could say an exact clone of God that between them there is not even like an iota of difference that is what Jesus Christ is and when God I'm going to keep this short and simple here today and then I will expound it later in a video that I will do once I'm back you know when I have a little more time okay once God did finish this process the process began long long time ago long even before long time before even Adam and Eve okay long time before ages before that so that process began and time passed and things happened, ages came, creatures were came, wars happened, worlds were made, worlds were destroyed, but it is all leading towards this end goal of God replicating himself in a created being, okay, of reproducing himself. And the reproduction of God, we are not talking about, when we think of human reproduction, okay, we think of the reproduction of the body, okay, that's it. But there is something that is in that body that makes that body a person, okay? So that is what the real reproduction is, the reproduction of the person, not of the body. Okay, so God did not have a body. God is a spirit. So when he was going to reproduce himself, he was not going to reproduce a body that would serve as the original. No, what served as the original excuse me, is the person of God, okay? And we will define person, okay? Next video, I will maybe go into a very in-depth definition of the word person as to what is a person, okay? Person includes like soul, includes spirit, includes consciousness. It includes, above all, a conscience, okay? God has a conscience. So it was, those are the things that make a person a person, whether it's a human person or an angel person or God the person. You've got to have a consciousness and conscience. Those are the two, two, what is it, what shall I say, indispensable characteristics without which it is not possible to be a person. Consciousness first and then a conscience. These two things have to exist in whether it exists in a body or it exists in a spirit which doesn't have a body, it doesn't matter. Okay, But without these things, no one can be a person. And it is the consciousness of God, and it is the conscience of God 
that is different than that of any of his created beings or it was different until Jesus Christ came into existence. So <clears throat> let's talk about this, uh, that when Jesus was born and he grew and eventually he died and he rose from the dead. Okay? When he was born here, he lived in the body of a man, okay, which means that he had great limitations that were placed upon him. He had the consciousness of God, but he lived in the body of a man. Okay, Having that existence in a body, it made him subject to all the weaknesses of man, to the you know, the, the uh, temptations of man, he, it, was, it made him subject to all those things, okay? So, that was what he was before he died on the cross. But after his resurrection, he is no longer, you know, in that same body or limited as he was before his death. Now he is in his person that dwells in an immortal body the exact and 100% identical copy of God the Father. That's who he is. In Hebrews 1, 3, we can read that he is the express image of God's person. Okay, that's what he is. He is an exact copy. There's no, not even like a particle of difference between them. Okay? So therefore, since he is the exact copy of the person of God, Therefore that, and yet there, one is the father and one is the son, just like Adam and Seth were two, but they had the same person, therefore they were one. Okay, the person that was copied into Seth was the person of Adam. Same thing with Jesus. Okay, the person that was copied over into this body is the person of God. So they are not two persons. When the people say, you know, he's the second person of the Trinity, no, there's only one person. He dwells in two forms now. One is God the Father who is spirit and one is in bodily form, which is Jesus. Okay, so there's two. But after Jesus, look at look at look at what was accomplished by doing this. So God became began as one, just as it happened with Adam. Okay? Then from that one, he united himself. This is this is the male and female comparison of Adam and Eve, okay? In uniting himself with a female, let's say, like with Mary, in Mary, in the womb of Mary, what was sown and what was born was the seed of the Word of God. Okay, so you could say that the Word of God, like Adam, was the male, and Mary would be like the female, the human. Okay, so this is spirit and flesh they are combining. And through that union came forth a son. That was the exact image of the Father, and that son is Jesus Christ. Just like Seth came out of the union of Adam and Eve, and he was an exact copy of the parents, the person of Adam. In Adam's person was contained the person of Eve as well. Okay? But anyhow, so that is exactly what happened that in this union God was no longer alone now okay he had now a second form of himself same person but in two now he had it's like a cell dividing okay so he had divided himself he had he had grown in a way that he was no longer just alone but he had two now okay so now what happens what did I say God is love so there was one love, that is the Father, and one love, who we can say, is the Son. So there's not just one that is love, there are two that are love, okay? And it's the same love, it's the love of God. It is God, okay? So now, God does not have, He is no longer alone. He has somebody to love, which is Jesus. The Father loved the Son, but what happened? The Son loved the Father in return. So that love that the Father gave the Son was given right back to Him. And that is what love is. Love is 
can only be given. Okay? It is only in giving love that love can be received. If you don't give love, love cannot be received. Okay, so God gave his love and then the son gave that love back. So now the purpose which God had created was that he was going to share himself. So that sharing happens by giving himself to the son and the son giving himself back to the father. So now we have two. And in the process of time, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as more and more children were begotten by the Father. And by the way, Adam is never called the begotten Son of God. Okay? He isn't, because he was not begotten of the Father. He was created by the Father. There is a difference between being begotten of God and being created by God. So Adam was created by God, true, but he was not begotten of God. Okay? That's another difference which I'll have to expound on at a later time. So Jesus is the only begotten and the first begotten. Okay? Jesus, the only begotten Son, was given by the Father and then He arose and thus He became the first begotten from whom there could be a second begotten and there could be a third begotten and there could be a millionth begotten and there could be a billionth begotten. We don't know the exact number but plenty. Okay? So now, the more that are begotten, the more love is multiplied. God is multiplied. The more there are to love and give love and to receive love, the more the experience of life, which is the experience of love, grows. Okay? This is why when God was alone, he had nobody to share himself. So he began this process by creating this whole creation, and eventually in the process of time came for Jesus Christ, who was his exact image, his exact copy, his exact clone, and he became the one that was no longer, God was no longer alone. He had a second that is also God, the Son. And from that Son, eventually, he begot himself a whole family. And this was the purpose of God creating Adam the way he did and then bringing forth Eve was so that they would eventually have a family. And this is what God did for himself. He has created a family of begotten children, okay? Of begotten sons, begotten daughters. And again, like, you know, you have to study that word begotten, which is the word genau in, in, in Greek, which is uh, from where we get the word genesis and genetics. And to, begot, to be begotten, to, uh, to, to where we get the word generation. All these words that are related to genetics, it, it is in that word genau. So essentially, when somebody is begotten of God, when it's begotten of man, they have the genes of man. When somebody's begotten of God, they have the genes of God. And what are we talking about, bodily genes here? No, we're talking about the genes, which would be the information that is his consciousness and his conscience. That is who the begotten children of God is, that they are one with God in their consciousness and in their conscience, okay? That is what makes them begotten of God. So when Jesus was had this work had been completed in Jesus and he had risen as the Lord God, the creator, as Adam's, as uh, what's his name, Thomas, the apostle said to Jesus, my Lord and my God, then God now could, just like with Adam and Eve, first they had Seth, and then from Seth there were more children that were born, and from Seth's children there were more children that are born. So suddenly the human family was no longer just one and then two and then four, it was multiplying and it grew. Like in the Bible says that, you know, they spread upon the face of the earth, like uh, in Genesis 6, where you're going to have some men began to multiply. So too with God, after Jesus, who came? Like what did Jesus say to Peter, you know, in uh, the book of John? Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, I love you. Okay, so what happened now? Has love been multiplied? First the father loved the son and the son loved the father. Now there are more sons. So the son, Peter, loves the son. And in loving the son, he loves the father, right? And what did the apostle Paul write? The life that I now live, I live by the faith of the son of God who loved himself, who loved me and gave himself for me. So there's another one that has been made perfect in love. 
Okay, so he has come to love God and therefore now has a relationship of love, a relationship of equals. See, only love can love love. That's a very uh, mouthful. Only love can love love. Okay, the love of God, no other creature can have because it's the love of God. It is not the love of man. It is not the love of angels. It is not the love of animals. It's the love of God. So therefore, for God to have somebody to love that could love, he had to make more of himself. Just like in Adam, the case of Adam, for him not to be alone, more of his own kind had to be made. Same thing with God. Well, he had to make more of his own kind. And that process began with Jesus Christ. And then it has grown and grown and grown. And now, you know, we told this like basically countless, I don't know, like, you know, there could be millions, there could be billions. So this is why the doctrine of Trinity again like falls apart. Because God is not just limited to three you know, to the three forms, you could say, one being God the Father, one being the Son of God, and one being the Holy Spirit. No, there are literally like millions and billions of them that can be the children of God, okay? And I'm talking like countless, because God in the Bible says they will be God, will be all in all of them. And if God is all in all of them, how many God are there? Does that mean they all have a different, they're all persons, uh, so it's like God one, God two, God three, God four, God billion? No. No, it's the same God that is in all of them. He has subdivided himself. He has distributed himself. He has split himself, you could say, literally. That's what he has done. Okay? And that is the reason why that is what happened. That is how love multiplied. That is how love grew. That is how God has multiplied. That is how God has reproduced. It, it happened as a process and it could only happen as a process. It required a great deal of pain and suffering. And that, my friends, is the real story of the Bible. It is the story of God reproducing himself in a literally a family that can be numbered in the billions and maybe even more I don't know but each one of them is love like God is love and each one of them in loving each other they are all giving their love to another Jesus said love one another so how do you love somebody you give your love so we are all giving our love and in giving our love all the love is going back to God this is what completes his experience of life because love is life this is how God lives. He lives through love. And he needed a whole family that he could love and that could love him back. And that, my friends, is what is the purpose of creation. All right, we'll continue talking about this later. Thank you for listening. This is Paul Sender.